Hello and welcome to Law of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. This has been a long time coming, but I've finally done it. A card I've discussed covering as far back as my Druid of the Flame video over a year ago, and one I said I'd cover once he was introduced to the game. I've been talking about covering this one since the release of Old Gods, and now, at last, you get to learn the story of the original Druid of the Flame. Fandral Staghelm. Unless you saw Noble's short video on Fandral, then you know his story, but we're going in depth. The art of the card is by the Russian artist Anton Zemzakov, who we've met in our Obsidian Destroyer episode. Warcraft is his favourite gaming franchise, and since our last episode, more of his art has been added to Hearthstone. Arcano Smith and his shield, Infest, Twilight Flamecaller, and Grime Street Informant. It's hard to find any information about the man himself, but there are plenty of ways to discover his art, so I encourage you to take a look after watching this episode, of course. 10,000 years ago, the demonic armies of the Burning Legion orchestrated their first assault upon the planet of Azeroth. Many fought and died for Azeroth's future, and many heroes were born. Arguably the greatest of these heroes was a night elf, the wielder of a magic until that point unknown to his people, the first druid. Malfurion Stormrage. Through the teachings of Cenarius, Malfurion was in tune with the natural world as no Night Elf before him ever had been, and if not for his unique skill set, Azeroth would surely have been consumed by the Legion. After what would come to be known as the War of the Ancients, Malfurion began to teach others in the way of the Druid, becoming their Shando honoured teacher. Malfurion's pupils devoted themselves to living in harmony with the natural world. It hasn't ever been explicitly stated as to when Fandral began his training as a druid, but it can be assumed he was among the first, later commanding the trust and respect of lower ranking druids. 9,400 years ago was an era of exploration for the druids. They experimented with shape-shifting, changing their forms into powerful bears, swift night sabers, and storm crows, granting them the ability of flight. Not all experimentation was successful, however. The pack form would change the druid's body into the shape of a wolf, and while this form was powerful and helped those in the form attack as a unit, druids would often give in to the savage nature of the form, attacking friend and foe alike. Not even Malfurion, the most powerful among the druids, could control the pack form, on one occasion attacking his master Cenarius. As a result, the pack form was outlawed, its use deemed too dangerous. Druids would often take long hibernations within the Emerald Dream. This realm is almost synonymous with druidism and depicts Azeroth as it would be if no intelligent beings had altered its surface. The realm of the dragon aspect Ysera, where the natural world could flourish unhindered. As the dream depicted nature without limits, there was a lot the druids could learn about their world from this realm. It also proved to have other uses during the War of the Ancients, Malfurion frequently journeying into this plane of existence to thwart the plans of the Legion. These hibernations became frustrating to the Sentinels, the fighting force created by the High Priestess of Elune Tyrande to safeguard Night Elf territory after the Legion's invasion. Before the War of the Ancients, the Night Elf military had been woefully underprepared to fight the Legion. The Sentinels performed their task admirably, but they often became frustrated that many of the Druids lay sleeping when their lands were under threat, not all of them able to lend their aid when required. However, an event 9,300 years ago saw all the Druids return to the Waking World, a threat too great for the Sentinels to handle, even with the Druids' assistance. The Legion did not make their own way to Azeroth, they were helped by the Highborn, the upper echelons of Night Elf society. In fact, it was the Night Elves' beloved Queen Azara that ordered the Legion's summoning, seduced by the power the army's leader Sargaris could gift her. Making use of the Emerald Dream, Malfurion defeated Azara's most powerful and insidious advisor, Xavius, reducing the wretched elf's body to ash. 
Sargeras, to whom failure was not an option, imprisoned what was left of the Night Elves' enfeebled soul. What Xavius would experience was torture beyond compare and measure, punishment for his shortcomings. Sargeras was no fool, however, and Xavius still had the potential to be a powerful servant to the Lord of the Burning Legion. So the Dark Titan reformed the Night Elf. While a few Night Elven features remained, Xavius' appearance became demonic. Large curling horns protruded from his head, thick fur covered his shoulders, forearms and legs which ended in cloven hooves. Xavius had become the first of many Night Elves loyal to the Legion to be transformed into Satyr. After the Legion's defeat, many Satyr remained upon Azeroth staying hidden within the dark corners of the world. The Horn Horrors gathered their strength, biding their time to enact their vengeance. Zalan the Feared offered his brethren the opportunity they had been waiting for. Rallying the Satyr and the Remnant Demons on Azeroth, Zalan attacked the Night Elf stronghold of Nightrun, triggering the War of the Satyr. The Satyr's initial assault was devastating, scores of sentinels and druids falling to their claws and corrupting the forest territory they controlled. The Night Elves' morale ebbed away, some druids even questioned the wisdom of their Shando, most notably Ralar Fangfire, who thought in these dire times the pack form should once again be allowed. As the war continued, the elves regained some level of stability and were even able to strike back at the satyrs thanks to the brilliant guerrilla tactics of Chandris Feathermoon, the adopted daughter of Tyrande. One of Chandris's raids even managed to eliminate Zalem, though many elves lost their lives in the process. Impatient and sick of the ongoing war, Rilar took matters into his own hands, once again experimenting with the pack form along with fellow druids. Their experimentation would lead to the discovery of a new form, wolf-like creatures that stood upon their hind legs, the Worgen form. As the Night Elves launched an assault upon the Satyr stronghold, Rilar and his what would become known as Druids of the Scythe joined the fray, eager to show their brothers and sisters their power, and for Rilar to prove his Shando wrong. At first, the Worgen tore through the Satyr, the demonic traitors buckling under the sheer brute force of the Druids. But as the Worgen fought on, they became consumed by their rage, no longer able to distinguish friend from foe and turned on their allies too, just as Malfurion had feared. The slaughter was made even worse by an unintended effect of the Worgen form. All those bitten by the Worgen also found themselves transformed into the beasts. As days and nights passed, the Worgen attacked both Satyr and Night Elf indiscriminately. To defeat the Worgen threat, Malfurion called several of his greatest students to Moonglade for a meeting, Fandral among them. Malfurion had consulted with Cenarius and proposed he and his fellow druids form the Cenarian Circle. What the Worgen had proven was that with their powers, druids were capable of devastating results if left unchecked. The Cenarian Circle looked to establish a tradition of druidism and ensure its members would always seek to do all it could to protect nature. This would ensure druids did not abuse their great connection with nature, preventing another tragedy like the Worgen. Fandral was the first to support this motion, stating, let this new order guide us truthfully. He was promptly followed in his approval by all other druids gathered. Establishing this new order was all well and good, but the Worgen was still running rampant. Malfurion had planned for this as well. Using the device that had imbued the Worgen with their new forms, the Scythe of a Loon as a catalyst, Malfurion sought to banish them to the Wild Realm within the Emerald Dream. Within this realm stood the tree Duralne, capable of soothing the Worgen's feral nature, sedating their rage and bringing an end to their madness entering an eternal dream. Fandral realised here that there was still much to be learnt of his craft. He had spent a great deal of time wandering the Emerald Dream, yet had never encountered or even heard of Duralnir. 
Fandral's travels were extensive, he would be one of the few druids to see the Eye of the Emerald Dream, where the green dragons congregated and the most beautiful part of the realm. Always hungry to learn, Fandral asked his Shando how he knew of this tree, but Malfurion did not divulge the information preoccupied with the Worgen threat, or possibly ashamed of his own inability to control the pack form. Cenarius had placed him under this tree to calm his feral rage years before. Either way, Malfurion's plan worked. The Worgen would eventually return thousands of years later, but we've already visited that tale in our Raging Worgen video. The Worgen banished, the Satyr defeated, Fandral returned to devoting much of his life to the Druidic calling. His hot-headed, abrasive personality often saw him disagree with his Shando and take part in many heated debates with Malfurion. Fandral would have clearly been revered by his peers, possessing golden eyes rather than the more common night elf colour of silver. It was said those with golden eyes would achieve great things. Powerful druids could have their eyes turn golden, taking on the glow of Azeroth's life. Despite his dedication, Fandral did find time to begin a family. Whether this happened before or after the War of the Satyr isn't clear. Even this early on in his story, tragedy found a way of tinging Fandral's life. The druid's wife died while giving birth to his son, Valstan, which undoubtedly shook Fandral, spiralling him into a deep depression. Fandral found solace in his son, however. Despite his coarse personality, Fandral clearly loved his son, and the two grew extremely close as a result. When Valstan married his wife, Leara, Fandral accepted her into the family as if she were his own daughter. When the Burning Legion was defeated at the end of the War of the Ancients, it triggered a near-world-ending event, sundering the once single continent of Azeroth into pieces. Unbeknownst to those dwelling on the planet's surface, this tectonic devastation had also broken down the integrity of prisons created long before the cells of the grotesque old gods. These beings once claimed Azeroth, seeking to corrupt the world, which housed the soul of an unborn titan, benevolent walking worlds that sought to bring order to the universe. Before the corruption was complete, the old gods were discovered by the titans. Their corruption too far gone for the titans to wrench these parasites off the face of Azeroth without killing the unborn titan. Instead, they created an army from the crust of Azeroth the Titan forged. It was this army that was eventually able to defeat the Old Gods and imprison them. The Old Gods were now so bound to Azeroth, killing them could also destroy the planet. The apocalyptic event of the Sundering stirred the Old Gods. Their prisons damaged, they seized this opportunity to once again spread their tendrils of corruption. For millennia, this slow and steady process continued, until approximately 4,500 years ago, when signs of the Old God's corruption began to be observed upon Azeroth's surface. The most apparent corruption was seen in Northrend, where the Old God yogg saron lay buried beneath. A new mineral was forming on the continent, rocky tumours containing the glowing green Saronite. This new mineral spread throughout the crust of the continent and other parts of Azeroth, sucking the life from the native flora and fauna. A small group of Cenarian Circle Druids, led by Fandral, decided they must act to eradicate the unnatural Saronite. Fandral's plan would involve the world tree, Nordrasil. One of the reasons Ashara and her Highborn were able to summon the Legion to Azeroth long ago was due to the swirling pool of arcane energy that lay at Azeroth's centre, the Well of Eternity. Using it, they could power the portals that brought the demons to their world. The Sundering was caused by the implosion of the Well of Eternity, but during the final battle of the war, Illidan's Stormrage, Malfurion's brother, gathered several vials of the well's enchanted waters. In the fallout of the continent's split, the remaining night elves fled northwest to Mount Hyjal, one of the few places untouched by the calamity. Here, Illidan emptied several of his vials into a lake at Hyjal's summit to cultivate a new Well of Eternity, as he believed when the Legion returned, they would need its power to fight them. This horrified the other Night Elves as the Well had played a major part in attracting the demons to Azeroth in the first place. For what was viewed as a crime among his people, Illidan was imprisoned. 
three of the great dragon aspects, Alexstrasza, Ysera and Nosdormu, upon hearing of the second world's creation, converged upon Mount Hygel. Alexstrasza cultivated an enchanted seed to sprout a towering tree over this new well of eternity. It was not long before the tree's canopy touched the top of the skies and its roots spread deep into the earth. Nordrasil, crown of the heavens in the night elven tongue, fed life-giving energy into the recently war-torn world and acted as a seal over the new well of eternity so that no one could abuse the water's power. The night elves vowed to nurture Nordrasil and keep it and the well of eternity safe. In honour of the Night Elves' noble decision, the three dragon aspects bless Nordrasil to empower its defenders. Alexstrasza infused Nordrasil with renewed strength and vitality. Ysera blessed the tree, binding it and its defenders to the Emerald Dream. While it was possible for druids to walk the Emerald Dream before this blessing, it was a process that required difficult meditation. Druids could now walk the dream whenever they wished. Nosdormu imbued the tree with his time-bending powers, meaning that the night elves that protect it were immortal. Their connection to Nordrasil made the elves immune to sickness, disease and the ravages of age. Since the World Tree had been able to revitalise the lands of Azeroth, most notably around Hyjal, Fandral and his group of druids were convinced the tree could do the same in Northrend, ridding the land of Saronite. Some druids in the group suggested they seek the advice of the dragon aspects. After all, they had grown the first tree and they would be able to advise of any unforeseen consequences that may arise from planting another. Fandral was insistent that there was no time for this consultation, as the Saronite was spreading unchecked throughout Northrend and had also been appearing in other parts of Azeroth as well. Rather than consult the dragons or the other members of the Cenarian Circle and risk one of his trademark heated debates with Malfurion, Staghelm moved to act. In secret, Fandral and his closest followers cut six branches from the boughs of Nordrasil. They set about planting these branches in areas infected by the Saronite, Ashenvale, Feralas, Crystal Song Forest, what would later become Duskwood, and the Hinterlands. Staghelm watched on with pride as these branches quickly took root and became trees of their own. Since they had been taken from Nordrasil, they too acted as conduits to the Emerald Dream, able to channel the dream's energies into the physical realm, renewing the wildlife in the surrounding area and cleansing those areas of Saronite completely. Spurred on by their success, Fandral's druids planted the last branch they had at the heart of the greatest Saronite growth within the mountains of Northrend, within a region that would become known as the Grizzly Hills. The benefits were near instantaneous, and the new world tree, Andrasil, the crown of snow, grew rapidly, ceasing the Saronite spread and once again allowing wildlife to flourish in the lands of Northrend. When Malfurion and the other members of the Cenarian Circle found out that Fandral and his followers had gone behind their backs to combat the Saronite, they were utterly furious. Though they were at least able to concede that it appeared Fandral's gambit had paid off, and it seemed that way for several decades. That would all change though. The Tunker and the forest nymphs that were native to the area in which Andrasil was planted became rabid. These two usually peaceful races clashed with one another in bloody battles. This fighting happened suddenly, was brutal, barbaric, and the races committed vile, perverted acts against one another. Eventually, word would reach the Cenarian Circle of this terrible war, and they dispatched a group to investigate the root of what had caused these two races to turn so violent. What the druids found made them feel sick to the pit of their stomachs. Androsil's roots had reached so deep into the earth of Northrend, they had permeated the prison of the maniacal yogg Saron. The old god quickly set about infusing the mighty tree with its foul energies, causing all living creatures in the surrounding area to be driven to madness. The Cenarian Circle knew that since the aspects had not blessed Androsil, the tree was susceptible to corruption. Being a 
cutting of Nordrasil made no difference. It was not only the wildlife, but Andrasil too suffered under yogg sarons control, its purpose being twisted and contorted, and the seemingly stoic tree reeled from the anguish it was put under. The Cenarian Circle knew there was no way to ease the world tree's torment, so with heavy hearts they decided to relieve it the only way they could. The druids felled the grand tree. The crash it made when it hit the ground not only reverberated around the lands of Northrend, but also within the Emerald Dream to which the tree was tied. The druids renamed the tree Vordrasil, the Broken Crown. While the druids were utterly crushed they had had to kill Andrasil, they were at least thankful that the tree had been able to stop the spread of Saronite. But unbeknownst to them, the damage yogg saron had wrought was far more devastating than any of the druids thought. yogg saron had been able to use the trees planted by Fandral as a doorway to the Emerald Dream, not only opening this realm to his own malignant corruption, but of the other old gods as well. The old gods cast small seeds of corruption throughout the dream. Over time, these seeds would germinate, polluting the realm's dreamways, beginning the creation of the Emerald Nightmare. Though his intentions were virtuous, Fandral's rash action had led to the beginnings of corruption within the sacred, natural paradise of the Emerald Dream. Looking back now to over 16,000 years ago, to the remnants of the Old God Empire. The Insectoid Akir, led by the Naraki Kithix, sought to once again claim Azeroth in the name of their masters. During this time, the Trolls ruled much of Azeroth, vicious hunters and fighters with an impressive ability to regenerate from wounds. Not wanting to give up their empire, the Trolls fought a long and gruelling war with the Akir, spanning centuries, the advantage shifting back and forth. Eventually, the trolls would kill Kithix and thin the Akir's numbers enough so that they were no longer interested in fighting, enforcing their colonies against troll aggression. Most of the Akir would remain within their colonies for thousands of years, forgotten by Azeroth's denizens, far the race's manted descendants that plagued the lands that would become Pandaria. One group of Akir had made their home within the Silithus Desert, within the Titanforged structure of Ankaraj. These Akir descendants would become the Karaji, and buried deep within Ankaraj was the dangerous presence of the old god Cthun. The Karaji's numbers grew, and they would lie dormant throughout the empty sandstone corridors of Ankaraj for millennia. Silithus was a dry, barren, and inhospitable place, but some hoped to change that 975 years ago. Fandral Staghelm, now an Ark Druid among the Cenarian Circle, organised an expedition of his people to bring life to Silithus. Fandral dispatched his son Valstan and a select group of his most trusted druids to perform this task. The party travelled the parched desert, searching for any water reservoirs that they could use to help them turn Silithus into a lush forest. Eventually, they would discover a monolithic structure, with architecture unlike any they had seen before. The shadow of Ankaraj loomed over Valstan and his companions. Not intimidated by the walls of Ankaraj, Valstan forged ahead into the structure, though some of his companions urged against it. Valstan cautiously paced through the cold corridors, but the eerie silence that permeated throughout Ankaraj would soon be broken. The presence of Valstan and his companions awoke the dormant Karaji, but they were not the only inhabitants to be disturbed by the Night Elves' presence. From his prison, Cthum became aware of the awakening Karaji and sought to use those that had served him in millennia past once again. The old god whipped the invertebrates up into a frenzy, the highest caste of Karaji motivating their silithid underlings. The Night Elves left as soon as they became aware of the murderous skittering horde. Valstan established an outpost near Ankaraj to keep an eye on the insectoid's activity and immediately sent out a request for aid to his father. With awestruck horror, the Elves watched as the swarm grew and grew, with seemingly every crevice of Ankaraj covered by Karaji, as if about to burst. All of a sudden, the Karaji poured forth from Ankaraj, engulfing large portions of the Silithus Desert and spreading to other regions as well. By this time, 
Vandral had arrived. The Archdruid commanded a force of druids, sentinels, priestesses, and keepers of the grove, and rallied them to confront the Karaji. Fighting was furious, and battles would often span several days and nights. Vandral chose his battles well, often exploiting natural advantages when launching attacks on the Karaji, making use of gorges so that his forces could not be flanked. He often led from the front, Valstan at his side, doing his best to seek out and slay Karaji generals to bring chaos to the Silithid rank and file. But each time Vandral's forces seemed to have pushed the Karaji back, they rallied once again regaining the territory they had lost. This constant shifting of front lines led to the conflict being named the War of the Shifting Sands. Vandral was able to establish several outposts in the desert, and eventually it seemed the elves were winning, able to push the Karaji forces back into the heart of Silithus. After driving back a particularly vicious Karaji attack, Vandral and his forces awoke to a new day, fully expecting the Karaji host to fall upon them yet again. Nothing. All was quiet, and an eerie foreboding filled the air. As Vandral prepared his forces to venture forward, a messenger came with dire news. Southwind Village was under attack. Vandral's immediate consideration was to pull his forces back to defend those at the village, but his sound judgement thought better of it. After all, if his forces abandoned their position, the rest of the Karaji forces would be free to push back against the elves. Then it would be far from a small counter-attack. Reading his father's inner turmoil, Valstan volunteered to take a small force to Southwind to push back the Karaji counterattack, allowing Fandral to press on with the main force to contain the Karaji. Fandral was slow to accept his son's offer, suspecting the attack may be some sort of ruse, but Valstan insisted. Surely we can't take that chance, father. I'll go. I will defend the city, and I will return victorious, upholding the honour of your name. Seeing his son's determination, Fandral reluctantly let him go. Just return alive, and I will be more than satisfied. For two days, the Night Elves pressed on, killing any Silithid that crossed their path. Fandral was often seen by his troops looking over his shoulder to the horizon, clearly concerned for his son and anxious for his return. At noon on the third day, the Karaji forces appeared again in much greater numbers, but they did not immediately swarm the Night Elves. Instead, they waited. Fandral quickly set about organising his troops for battle, all while the watching Karaji waited. Certain all eyes were upon them, the Karaji ranks parted, allowing one of their most respected commanders to pass through. Rajax towered over his brethren, a tough carapace covering his body. He held no weapon, as his monstrous claws were more than enough. Fandral had no time to gaze in awe at the hideous creature. He was far more concerned for the limp, bloody body that Rajax dragged alongside him, Valstan. The Archdruid was overcome by waves of conflicting emotion, fear, anger, and despair. As soon as Fandral saw his son still stirred, he bolted for him, the Druid's forces following. Fandral ran as fast as he could, fueled by utter desperation. Rajax hoisted Valstan into the air, placed the helpless elf between his claws, and wrenched him apart, torso and legs crashing to the ground, no longer attached. Fandral's forces rushed on to meet the Karaji in battle, but what Fandral had witnessed was too much to bear. The person he loved more than any other had been brutally butchered before his eyes. Fandral fell to his knees, utterly crushed, unable to think clearly as his forces rushed past him to join the battle. Without the strong leadership of the Archdruid, Staghelm's forces began to lose ground rapidly to the Karaji. Fandral did his best to command them, but was unable to properly organise his thoughts. Luckily, he still had enough sense to realise that the Night Elves needed to retreat. But this did not stop the Karaji from slaughtering many of their ranks and working themselves up into a bloody frenzy. The Karaji attack with abandon, pushing all the way into the Tanaris Desert. However, their reckless assault also saw them bring their invasion to the Caverns of Time, home 
of the bronze dragonflight. The dragons joined the fray and enlisted the aid of the red, green and blue flights as well. While this stalled the Karaji advance, their numbers were so great they seemed impossible to vanquish. Fandral began to fear the war would never end. Thousands of his people had already died and he was loath to sacrifice more. In the end, Fandral and the dragons devised a plan to end the war by sealing the Karaji back within the walls of Ankiraj. The elven and dragon forces gathered before Ankiraj. And with Fandral leading them, the druids focused every ounce of their power into driving back the insectoid forces. Then, together with the dragons, the elves summoned an impenetrable barrier. The earth split open, creating a towering blockade of earth, stone and root. The scarab wall was capable of keeping the Karaji forces locked away in Cthulhu's prison for a very long time. The leader of the bronze dragonflight forces, Anacronus, son of the Aspect Nosdormu, created two artifacts, the Scarab Gong and the Scepter of the Shifting Sands. If ever the need arose, the Gong could be struck with the Scepter and the way to Ankaraj would be opened. For safekeeping, the Scepter was entrusted to Fandral. Staghelm found no solace in victory over the Karaji. The death of Valstan still haunted him. In a moment of grief-stricken rage, Fandral shattered the Scepter scattering the pieces. They would remain lost for nearly a thousand years until heroes needed to reassemble the scepter to confront Cthulhu. Upon returning from the war, Fandral buried his son. During one visit to his grave, Fandral met with Leara. Time passes, yet the sting of his death will not fade. Valstan, my dear husband, you left us too soon. Our child has been born. It's a girl, a beautiful baby girl. I named her Astaria. She has your eyes. Leara, the two of you are all I have left. I swear to you, on my life, you and my granddaughter will always have my protection. In remembrance of his son, Fandral would have a statuette of him carved that he would keep in his chambers. A little over a decade ago, the Burning Legion launched their second invasion upon Azeroth. Their coming heralded by their servant, the Lich King, whose undead scourge weakened the human and high elven kingdoms before the Legion's arrival. Fandral, like many others, took up the call to arms. The war would culminate in a battle at Mount Hyjal, the Legion commander Archimon smashing through the forces of the Alliance, Horde, and the Night Elves to reach the World Tree at the mountain summit, no doubt looking to use the power sealed beneath for a nefarious purpose that would leave Azeroth utterly helpless. Archimon reached Nordrasil, but Malfurion had a plan. In unison, thousands of wisps, spirits of nature, encircled the demon tearing apart his physical form. Archimon's body was destroyed in a fiery explosion. While this saved Azeroth, it heavily damaged the World Tree. Nordrasil would renew over time, but the Night Elves had lost much through the tree being damaged. They were no longer immortal, the Aspect's blessings no longer effective. Wishing to regain his race's immortality and the other benefits Nordrasil had blessed them with, Fandral proposed to the Cenarian Circle that they grow a new World Tree, reconnecting their spirits with the Eternal World. This caused much debate within the circle. Fandral's greatest critic was Malfurion Stormrage himself, whose wisdom had yet again saved Azeroth. Malfurion told his fellow druids that by planting a new tree, they would not regain their blessings, as nature would not reward such a selfish act. However, during a journey to the Emerald Dream to replenish his strength, Malfurion also took it upon himself to explore irregularities in the dream, but from his sleep he did not wake. His spirit became lost, wandering the dream. In the physical realm, preparations were made to care for Malfurion's physical form, as many druids tried and failed to find his dream self. In Malfurion's absence, Fandral took over as leader of the Cenarian Circle, with little protest from his fellow druids. 
Fandral's abilities as a druid were second only to Malfurion's, doing all he could to connect with the natural world. He even took to not wearing shoes so that his body was in constant contact with nature. Fandral declared his main objective as leader would be to bring Malfurion back to the waking world. Staghelm was slowly able to win over the majority of his fellow druids and the Circle of Ancients, a trusted group of tree-like guardians, to the idea of creating a new world tree. With it decided, the druids set about growing the world tree Teldrassil at the northernmost point of the continent of Kalimdor. Teldrassil was an impressive creation, with a trunk that dwarfed villages and cities. In fact, Teldrassil's branches stretched so far and so thick that most of Night Elf society was able to live among its branches, even building their new capital city Darnassus upon the tree. The city was just as magnificent and great in size as the human capital of Stormwind or the orcish capital of Orgrimmar. The tree captured enough dew to create running rivers, streams and lakes among its boughs, sustaining bountiful life upon the tree. It was not just Night Elves that would come to call Teldrassil their home. However, over time the elves did not regain their immortality, as Fandral had hoped, as the tree was not blessed by the aspects. When Fandral approached Nosdormu and Elekstraza to request these blessings, he was scolded by Nosdormu for his arrogance, and both refused. Over time, Teldrassil's flawed conception became more apparent. Corruption worked its way into the tree's branches, and Satyr and Grell took up residence upon the tree. Two places within Darnassus caught the eye more than any other, and still do to this day. The Temple of the Moon, where the priestesses of Elune practiced their faith, led by High Priestess Tyrande Whisperwind. Leading both the Night Elven religion and the Sentinels, Tyrande's word held a lot of sway in the governance of Darnassus. The other was the Cenarian Enclave home to the druids of the city, a place Malfurion had hoped to create before his coma, and much of the enclave was built to his suggestions. The druids were also well respected among other night elves, and that meant Archdruid Fandral also held a lot of sway in Darnassus. When it was Tyrande and Malfurion leading their people, their rule was harmonious. After all, the two had been in a romantic relationship spanning over 10,000 years. The dynamic between Tyrande and Fandral was quite different. During the War of the Shifting Sands, Fandral's leadership had been sound, but now, to others' surprise, he was far more contentious and abrasive, frequently clashing with Tyrande as to how to best rule their people. While Tyrande respected Fandral, she was certainly no pushover and would always fight her corner. Fandral began to exude arrogance as a leader. Believing in the Night Elves' inherent superiority over other races, he took more active military action against the Orcs in Kalimdor. Some saw this as a positive, Fandral regaining some of the vigour that had left him after Falstant's death. However, his arrogance also carried over to his role in the Cenarian Circle. After the Battle of Mount Hyjal, inspired by the work of the Druids, the Tauran Hamal Rune Totem approached Malfurion asking to be taught the Druidic arts. Malfurion accepted and befriended the Tauran, much to Fandral's distaste, who objected to other races learning the ways of the Druid. Hamal proved to be an excellent student, and achieved the rank of Archdruid in impressive time, and he would pass on his knowledge of the ways of the Druid to other Tauren. While Hamul was a Tauren and allied with the Horde, he was always loyal to the Cenarian Circle, despite the Night Elves' allegiance with the Alliance. Now that Fandral led the Circle, his previous xenophobia toward Tauren carried over. He would sometimes show outright disgust towards his Tauren colleagues. For adventurers that approached Fandral within the Enclave, he had a quest for them. He was collecting large quantities of Morrowgrain, and tasked heroes to collect him samples of soil from the Ungoro Crater. Fandral told those that saw him that Morrowgrain was a plant the Cenarian Circle knew little about. The Arcturid claimed he was seeing how the grain would react when grown in the different Ungoro soil samples. The druid Quintus Jonespire was concerned by Fandral using the Circle's name to gather the grain, as he had heard under the right conditions that the grain exuded qualities similar to herbs used for primitive curses, Jonespire's chosen field of expertise. 
One set of heroes that approached Fandral around this time were Brol Bearmantle and his friend Logosh, who it would later be revealed was part of the King of Stormwind, Varian Rin, his memory failing him. Brol had come to inform the leader of the Circle that the idol of Remulus had been cleansed. The idol was gifted to Brol by the son of Cenarius, Remulus, who had crafted the idol and had Ysera bind it to a powerful green dragon that not even he knew the identity of. During the Battle of Mount Hyjal, Brol fought the Pit Lord Asgalor. Brol was brought to his knees by a mighty bolt of fell energy, dropping the idol, which Asgalor struck with his blade and corrupted. Brol also lost his daughter Anessa that day, who jumped in front of a second volley of fell energy to save her father. With the loss of a child, Fandral and Brol had common ground and as a result, a mutual respect. Brol informed Fandral of where he found the idol, in a Firbolg den. The usually peaceful creatures were corrupted and driven mad by the idol's power. With difficulty, Brol was able to reach and cleanse the idol, quelling the Firbolg's rage. Fandral's first statement after this tale was that he understood Brol wished to embark on further quests, which Brol affirmed. He wanted to help Logosh to regain his memories. As Brol's mission may lead him down an unpredictable path, Fandral thought it best he hand the idol over for safekeeping. As Brol and Logosh left, the human told the druid that he did not trust Fandral, the circle's leader seemingly far too eager for Brol to hand over the idol. Brol tried to ease Logosh's mind, saying the idol was bound to him. The only others that were able to use it were powerful arc druids like Malfurion Stormrage, and as Logosh correctly pointed out, Fandral. Brol dismissed the concern, as Fandral was the leader of the Scenarian Circle and could be trusted implicitly. Fandral later used the idol to call Brol back to Teldrassil. The corruption that had taken root in the tree's boughs, allowing Grell and Satyr to take up residence, was worsening. Teldrassil was sick. Fandral called the most powerful druids of the Scenarian Circle to convene at Teldrassil, including Brol and Hamul. Some were unable to attend as the disturbing malady that seemed to keep Malfurion within the Emerald Dream now claimed them as well. Fandral asked the druids that they gather at the base of Teldrassil in a secluded area of Rutheran village. The village surrounded a teleporter which could transport those that stepped through it to Darnassus. This was irregular as most Scenarian Circle meetings would take place in the Scenarian Enclave. This had many of the druids hopeful that Fandral had found a way to waken their beloved Shando, Malfurion Stormrage. Many attempts had been made previously, but all failed. The druids even trying to reach out to Ysera, the guardian of the Emerald Dream, but she had no success reaching Malfurion either. Malfurion's plight had been kept secret from many night elves up until recently, as there seemed to be no end to it. Hence why many thought this meeting would relate to his revival. The need to revive Malfurion was all the more pressing as the Emerald Nightmare devoured more and more of the Emerald Dream with each passing day. Fandral entered the gathering through the bark of Teldrassil, the other druids bowing their heads in respect to their leader. Staghelm was plain and honest as to why he had brought the druids here. Teldrassil is ill, he proclaimed. While many of the druids gathered had suspected this, it was a shock to hear Fandral say it so plainly. After all, Teldrassil was a product of his planning, and none cared for and looked after Teldrassil as much as the Arc Druid. The illness must have taken a turn for the worse for him to admit it out loud. The Arc Druid told his fellows that they should not despair though, as he had called them all to the roots of Teldrassil to help the World Tree heal. Fandral was questioned how the World Tree would be cured, and to Brol's shock, the Arc Druid revealed the Idol of Remulus. Brol argued that using the Idol was not the best idea, but Fandral believed it essential, crediting Brol's wariness of the artifact to his history with it. Fandral went on that with the World Tree cured, they could resume their search for Malfurion. With a healthy World Tree to help in their efforts, they would surely be successful. Fandral forbade any druids from entering the Emerald Dream until the World Tree was cured. As no contact had been established with Ysera for some time, and surely Malfurion would not want any more lives lost for his sake. The druids clasped their hands together, preparing to begin their healing as Fandral moved toward the trunk of Teldrassil, 
and placed his hand upon it. Something stirred within the tree, which each of the druids felt so closely connected to the tree they had helped sprout. The ground shook underneath the druids, and long roots burst from beneath them, wrapping round each of the druids, establishing a physical connection with the tree. Encircled in his root, with more vines sprouting from it to make Night Elf and Tree One, Fandral held out the idol of Remulus. The figurine faintly glowing green as its power was channeled. Teldrassil fed on the power of the idol and that of the druids one with the tree. The druid's senses did not just feel Teldrassil's presence, but that of all of Azeroth so closely connected with their planet was the world tree. As he experienced this otherworldly sensation, Brol felt a touch of weakness, but Fandral steadied him, assuring him and the other druids of the safety of what he had planned. Brawl continued to aid in the spell, eager to help his Shando after the tree was cured, but no sooner did he think of Malfurion, he felt a jarring in his consciousness. A darkness, followed by a familiar voice. Before he knew who it was, Brawl panicked, and his connection with Teldrassil snapped. Approached by other druids, he assumed it had been he that had stopped the spell work. But it was Fandral. The Arc Druid had sensed the arrival of others. Tiranda and several priestesses of Elune had arrived at the meeting. The High Priestess came bearing terrible news. Elune had granted her a vision with the stark truth that Malfurion was dying. Fandral was shocked. Malfurion's Barrowden was secure in Moonglade with priestesses tending to his body's needs. But a vision from the Moon Goddess was never taken lightly, and none were more in tune with her than Tiranda. The druids temporarily stopped their work on Teldrassil to visit their Shando's Barrow Den. Tiranda was the first to inspect her love's unmoving body, to make certain of the truth in the vision she received. This change was odd, Malfurion had been looked after as well as he possibly could be. Nothing should have changed, but it had. Malfurion's body had grown colder than it ever had been and his golden eyes were losing their glow, as if the druid was losing his connection to Azeroth. Elune's vision was true. Fandral stepped forward next, inspecting his Shando's body. He muttered under his breath and passed both hands over his teacher. Brol noticed the archdruid also scattered a small pinch of powder over Malfurion as well. He was not sure what Fandral intended, but as Staghelm stepped back, a single tear rolling down his cheek, Brawl prayed to the woodland spirits that it would help. Fandral, convinced that there was nothing more they could achieve in the Barrow Den, instructed his druids outside, the priestesses resuming their constant vigil. Outside the Barrow Den, in the resplendent natural beauty of Moonglade, Fandral, his druids and Tyrande met with the Glade's Keeper. Remulus. Out of respect, the druids took a knee, and Tyrande bowed deeply, but Remulus did not think he deserved their respect. Several times he had tried to save Malfurion, and several times he, the supposedly powerful son of Cenarius, had failed. He came to check on Malfurion's condition, and was somewhat surprised when Tyrande told him the druid was now dying. This did make sense to Remulus. The nightmare was swelling within the Emerald Dream faster than ever, and now controlled so much of it that its gibbering madness could be heard throughout the entirety of the dream. Its swifter movement through the dream had seen more of the dream's defenders swallowed and claimed by the nightmare, now serving it and its spread. Noticing Brawl, Remulus addressed Fandral. He wondered if the idol he had crafted was still in the Arc Druid's care. When Fandral confirmed it was, Remulus immediately told the Druid that under no circumstances should the idol be used. The Keeper said he could give no more explanation as to why, as he was not sure if his suspicions were correct. But Fandral swore he would not use the idol. Remulus departed on a disturbing piece of news. There were whispers of sleepers appearing in kingdoms across Azeroth, people that would not wake, their sleeps disturbed by horrific nightmares. Those who had not elected to travel to the Emerald Dream, but seemed to be caught in the nightmare nevertheless. At this point, it was thought these may only be whispers, but this situation would worsen, the sleep claiming important political figures such as Thrall. 
Jaina and Anduin. Mists would appear around Azeroth, within it horrifying figures that played off the nightmares of any who looked into it. These were the beginnings of the nightmare spilling over into the physical realm. The mists encircled capital cities, the figures within, those that were sleeping, eerily staring up at the walls, as if waiting for a signal. After being told of the whispers Remulus had heard, Fandral's resolve remained strong. He was convinced the best and only way to save Malfurion would be to heal Teldrassil. His conviction was not shared by Tyrande, but she knew there was no changing the stubborn druid's mind. The druids rested the night in Moonglade as the journey back to Darnassus was a lengthy one. In the morning, the druids met and Fandral announced that due to the pressing nature of their work, the healing of Teldrassil would begin again that night. This would give the druids barely any time to recover after a long flight, but Fandral thought it necessary. Upon returning to Darnassus, the druids immediately continued their work, but one was not among them, Brol. The druids constantly tried to relieve the world tree of its sickness. Try as they might, their efforts seemed to do nothing, and some, such as Hamul, even thought the world tree's condition was worsening. Fandral denied these claims, and assured those that gave their all to renew Teldrassil that their efforts were not in vain. When Fandral noticed Brol's disappearance, he asked the druid's close friend Hamul to look for him. Brol had left in secret so that he could devote his efforts, along with Tyrande, to reviving Malfurion. In order to do this, he had stolen the idol of Remulus from Fandral's home in the Cenarian Enclave. Fandral had set traps by his home, with buds that shot quickly hardening sap at those that tried to enter, but Brol had found a way round them. Hamul did not precisely know Brol's intent or where he had gone, not privy to the druid's meeting with Tyrande, but he knew he would not find the Night Elf around Darnassus. Hamul did feel guilty for not telling Fandral this, but had promised his friend he would remain silent. As Hamul went searching for Brol, Fandral instructed the other druids they clear their minds for a different spell to help Teldrassil, while he went to his sanctum in the Cenarian Enclave. Fandral said he was to seek guidance in seclusion and peace. Upon reaching his residence, Fandral noticed the idol was no longer there. Changing to his Stormcrow form, he travelled back to the gathered druids, and when he changed back to his Night Elf form, his vision was fixed on Hamul, who had returned to the gathering. Hamul could see in Fandral's look, he knew what Brol had done, and his intentions, and Hamul's secrecy. Other druids took this as a sign Hamul had done something wrong, and thus he became somewhat of a pariah among his fellows. As the druids worked, the mists built. Fandral over time would come to the realisation that perhaps he had been too hard on Hamul, and sought his fellow arc druid out. He found Hamul at the base of the tree, his hand against the world tree's trunk. Fandral greeted Hamul, startling the druid who had not heard him approach. Hamul seemed disturbed and told Fandral what he had found. He feared Teldrassil's condition was worsening, but before he could explain why, Fandral walked to the tree and rested his hand on the trunk. After a few moments, Fandral stated he noticed nothing different, and if anything, there was an improvement. Before Hamul could articulate his surprise, Fandral moved on, crediting Hamul's worries to weariness. The leader of the circle also said he had been remiss in his treatment of Hamul. After all, Hamul had not told him Brol had gone due to a wish to remain loyal to his friend. Fandral's disappointment, he admitted, should not be directed at Hamul, but Brol. Fandral told Hamul he had come up with a new spell to aid the World Tree, and the Tauren's robust spirit would be of tremendous value to the effort. Surely, if Hamul was worried about the World Tree, this news would be welcomed by him. And it was. Though, as Fandral began to explain, Hamul couldn't help think of what he had experienced at the trunk of Teldrassil. His concerns had been eased somewhat by Fandral, but as the Tauren had his hand to Teldrassil, he could hear the World Tree's voice. Frantic, unintelligible whispering had run through the Tauren's head. The World Tree was going mad. In pursuit of their own mission, Brol and Tyrande had travelled to the Emerald Dream. The nightmare and its corrupted forces 
were relentless. Protectors of the dream had come to defend it, but try as they might, the nightmare pushed on. Amongst the chaos, Malfurion was freed. He had undergone years of pain and torture at the hand of his captor, the being that led the nightmare forces the Nightmare Lord. All that had been seen of this mysterious malevolent being was the shadow of a twisted tree. However, upon Malfurion's rescue, Ysera was captured by the Nightmare. This is what the Nightmare Lord had been waiting for. With the Dragon Aspect's guardianship interrupted, the Nightmare swept through the dream freely. The fog in the physical realm no longer waited outside cities, it spilled into them, plunging even more people into an unending sleep. Malfurion returned to his physical form, and due to his great druidic experience could immediately identify what had been killing his body, a fine powder used in curses further enchanted to ensure his death, Morrowgrain. Luckily for Malfurion, his attacker underestimated the healing powers of the priestesses in their moon goddess who looked over him. Malfurion expelled the Morrowgrain from his body and made his way to the surface. He had intended to return to the dream immediately to help rescue Ysera, but was disturbed to see that Moonglade was shrouded in eerie mist, its inhabitants asleep. Deciding it was far too risky to enter the Emerald Dream again here, Malfurion decided he would seek out allies and do all he could to help those in the Emerald Dream. As he transformed into a Stormcrow and flew into the air, he was horrified to see the mist spread all over the land. Back in Darnassus, Hamal, the Druid Naralex and Chandris suspected there was a traitor in their midst. When Hamal and Naralex bumped into Chandris, the traitor was onto them. Vine shot from the ground looking to bind them. The druids transformed into their flight forms and lifted Chandris, but they were also attacked from above. The leaves that fell from Teldrassil's branches had morphed into shadowy apparitions, their touch chilling the companions' very souls. Naralex was swarmed by the shadows. Hamal was able to defend himself, throwing powder over the shadows that turned them back to leaves. Not expecting this, the Torum was stunned. No, it could not have gone this far, was all he could say before his shock cost him, shadows falling upon the Torum. Chandris was seized by the vines and knocked to the edge of consciousness by a branch striking the back of her head. With the three incapacitated, the traitor revealed himself. Fandral calmly strode out from the trees, sincerely apologising to those that had been attacked. Since these three now knew Fandral was not to be trusted, he knew that something had to be done with them. Fandral said he would consult Valstan. In truth, Fandral had been a long-acting servant of the Nightmare Lord, and the spells he had been asking his fellow druids to cast had been further infecting Teldrassil with the Nightmare. Fandral had taken great care to hide the corruption from his fellow druids. He was spurred to this action from advice that he believed came from his son. In reality, it was the Nightmare Lord projecting an image of Valstan to deceive Fandral, playing on the druid's love for his son to get him to do what he wanted. Malfurion soon arrived at Teldrassil, one of the only places in Azeroth not to be shrouded in the thick mists of the Nightmare. Immediately, the Archdruid was able to sense the evil that infested Teldrassil, and was surprised that none of his fellow druids had picked up on this. As Malfurion dove to warn his fellow Circle members of the evil their spellcasting wrought, he felt someone trying to contact him. It was Hamul, but all Malfurion could ascertain from the contact was a warning. Instead of going directly to the druids, Malfurion diverted and travelled to Darnassus. Malfurion arrived at the Cenarian Enclave and saw Hamor, Narolex, and Chandris bound, all unconscious. He realised he had been lured here. Fandral mocked his Shando, always the only one who can save the world, because he deems himself the only one. Staghelm had prepared for Malfurion's coming, having sensed his awakening long ago. Malfurion became aware that Fandral had gone insane when accusing Hamul and his companions of being a danger to all of Azeroth. 
when Malfurion tried to convince Fandral of the ridiculousness of this claim, Fandral called him a liar as he had been told so. When Malfurion tried to find out who had been telling Fandral this, the current leader of the Circle responded with sadness. He now believed that Malfurion was a traitor too, but he was too dangerous. Hamul and all the others that now slept would wake refreshed and renewed and all would be right with Azeroth. Malfurion again told Fandral he was misguided. None of those who now slept would awaken. The nightmare now extended beyond the dream and everywhere was now under siege from its evil and that evil now filled Teldrassil. Seeing this as a slight against the world tree Malfurion had objected to, Fandral took umbrage, but Malfurion continued. He pleaded with his fellow druid to reach out and touch the heart of Teldrassil, and Fandral would see it was corrupted. Fandral stared down at Malfurion. He knew Teldrassil's heart better than anyone. It had been he that had been instrumental in the tree's birth. He had given his life to the tree, and Fandral believed it was because of this that the great Teldrassil had returned his son to him. Malfurion, realising Fandral was beyond reach, began to concentrate on a way to stop his mad pupil. Fandral frowned and looked down upon his shadow with sadness. That was your last chance, my teacher. The shadow masquerading as Valstan over Fandral's shoulder began to cackle as the ground shook. Fandral said he had told his son they should wait, but again, his son seemed to have been correct. The corruption within Teldrassil manifested upon the surface. Vines burst from the ground, shadowy creatures manifested, and rot covered the land. The Night Elves' own home had turned against them, consumed by the nightmare. Malfurion had no choice but to fight his student. Fandral was delusional and thought what was destroying the world was in fact saving it. The two seemed evenly matched. Malfurion was not just fighting Fandral, but also the evil that swarmed Teldrassil. His efforts bore fruit, freeing Fandral's three captives and allowing others of the Scenarian Circle to make their way to the Enclave, whom Hamol and Chandris led. Narelex was still unconscious from Fandral's earlier vicious attack. Fandral lessened his assault. He too sensed the other druids approaching and needed to make it look more as if Malfurion was the aggressor, but was clearly enraged when he realised his prisoners had been freed. Fandral played to the crowd, noticing Brol was among them, congratulating the other druids for rounding up the traitors. But many of the druids now saw clearly that it was Fandral, who was the traitor. Fandral fumed, accusing all those that defied him as traitors, and with a sway of his hand, many of the druids clutched their chests. One of the druids had a vine burst from his chest. As he tried to remove it, more burst from the druid to consume his body. More druids had vines spring from them, and to Malfurion's dismay, some joined with Fandral to aid him. They too seemed to have been seduced by the nightmare. Malfurion instructed Brawl to deal with the vines while he fought Fandral. Malfurion focused his attack anew, but not on Fandral. He struck the shadow that Fandral believed was Valstan with Starfire. Fandral looked on with horror as he lost his son for a second time. When Malfurion had fully destroyed the shadow, all Fandral could do was stare, utterly crushed. With Fandral incapacitated, Malfurion went in search of the root of Teldrassil's corruption. He found a branch starkly different from the rest, that he could see had been tended to many times by Fandral. Transforming into a bear, Malfurion tore the insidious graft from Teldrassil. It was a branch from the Nightmare Lord. As Malfurion eyed the branch, he noticed a thick liquid dripping from the end of the stump. Blood. He realised then who the Nightmare Lord was. A powerful demon who he had defeated finally by twisting their body into a tree. Xavius. Teldrassil would stand, but much damage had been done. Malfurion instructed Chandris that Darnassus should be evacuated as the city may collapse. Despite the odd creaking and cracking, 
The tree was safe and relatively calm. An agonising scream tore through Darnassus, a cry of loss and woe. The druids had emerged from the enclave, the traitors subdued, but Fandral's sanity had been completely shattered. He cried for the son he had lost again, desperately screaming Valstan's name, begging him to come back to him, his eyes staring blankly. Malfurion thought to himself that he would do all he could to redeem the wayward druids that had betrayed the Cenarian Circle. But as he looked at Fandral, he feared his old friend was too far gone to ever be brought back from the depths of insanity. The druids now needed to travel to the Emerald Dream to fight Xavius, and knew the best way to do this would be to travel there physically through a portal. Entering their meditative sleep would be too dangerous and could see them be instantly claimed by the Nightmare. Xavius was wise to this and shut off all known portals to the Dream. To try and find an answer to his predicament, Malfurion communed with the recovering Teldrassil. Already, most of the tree's strength had returned. It revealed to him another portal close by. Fandral had created his own portal to the Emerald Dream, and with this, Malfurion was able to travel to the Dream and thwart Xavius' plans, saving Azeroth and the Emerald Dream from the Nightmare. At least for now. Fandral was imprisoned and watched over by wardens in Mount Hyjal. When Deathwing returned, causing the cataclysm that wrought chaos across the entirety of Azeroth, the corrupted dragon aspect brought the Fire Lord Ragnaros back to the world. Ragnaros's forces assaulted Hyjal, looking to burn down a regrown Nordrasil. As the Fire Lord's forces edged closer and closer to the tree, the green dragon Elisra became worried. The army also drew closer to Fandral's prison, and the dragon feared that if they reached the Night Elf, they would be able to use Fandral's knowledge of the Night Elves and the World Trees for their own nefarious purposes. Elisera's fears were confirmed when she discovered the Twilight's Hammer, a cult in service of the Black Dragon, were trying to capture Fandral. Elisra requested heroes help her escort Fandral from his prison. It was already under assault from the hammer, so to allow the heroes to return Fandral quickly, Elisra had them travel through the Emerald Dream. Fandral was led safely from his cell, and Elisra escorted him to a safe place to stop the enemy getting their hands on him. When the hero told Ysera of what Elisra had done, the Aspect questioned the wisdom of this action, thinking it unwise. The aspect would soon be proved right. As the land was being torn apart during the Cataclysm, orcs under the command of their current warchief, Garrosh Hellscream, pushed further into contested territory. One of these territories was Ashenvale. The Horde tore through Night Elven controlled territory, and one of those slain was Valstan's daughter. As Leara mourned at her daughter's grave, she was visited by someone unexpected. I tried to save you, Astaria, but I was too weak. Vandral would never have allowed the Horde to attack our home. And who did Malfurion send to defend us? No one! Your anger is not misguided. Who's there? One who shares your pain. One who offers you the power to assuage it. Vandral! You escaped from prison? I was rescued by some new allies. I'm sorry I was not here sooner. What is this power? What have you become? You will learn in due time, my daughter. Come with me. Together, we will bring vengeance to those who have wronged us. Fandral had returned, now a druid of the flame, empowered by the flames of the Fire Lord. He had somehow been delivered to Ragnaros' hands. Some of Fandral's sanity had been restored, but now rather than protect Azeroth, he wanted to see the entire world burnt to ash, as a world without his son was not worth living in. Fandral wanted others to feel the searing pain that he had now lived with for some 1,000 years. He would have his revenge upon Malfurion. Fandral now acted as Ragnaros' second in command, given the rank 
of Major Domo. After recruiting Leara as his second in command and several other druids to his new order, Vandral revealed himself to his enemies, interrupting an effort by the dragon aspects Thrall and Malfurion to return Nordrasil to full strength to help combat Deathwing's forces. Do you think it will work, Goel? The druids and shaman uniting to restore the world tree? Would it actually heal this broken world? The Aspects believe it will, and they should know. They grew it in the first place. Welcome, son of Duratan. And to you, Agralon of the Frost Wolves. Lady Sera. Greetings, friends. A sense of vast power has grown within you, young Thrall. You've achieved much since last we met. Master Stormrage, it's good to have you back in the waking world. Friends, we have gathered here today to heal this world that we've sacrificed so much to save. For the first time, the Earthen Ring and the Sonarian Circle will unite to restore this great tree, thereby healing the whole of Azeroth. Time is precious, sister. Let us see to our ritual. I'm sorry. Are we interrupting? The Twilight's Hammer! Not so fast, son of Durotan. You and your allies have certainly set us back, but the hour of twilight cannot be averted! The Twilight Prophet knows that you, and you alone, are our final obstacle. He sent me to remove you from the game. I do not fear death. Death? <laughs> Who said anything about death? Go ahead! You no. may be this world's greatest shaman thrall, but you are only mortal. This is my master's curse upon you, turning your great bond with the elements into your undoing! Even now, the elements are tearing you apart, and they shall feed upon your doubts and fears till the last spark of life on this wretched world has been snuffed out! You'll regret this, stranger! <laughs> Will I? Come, Shando. Certainly you recognize your former pupil. Fandral, what have they done to you? Naive as always, I see. Your pet orc cannot save you now, Malfurion. And the flame of our vengeance draws near. Be ready! Fandral is corrupting fellow druids into something sinister. He may have other followers already. I must warn Moonglade. But what of Goel? He was the Earthen Ring's most powerful shaman, and the ceremony cannot continue without him. But we must be prepared to accept that he may be lost forever. To get answers as to how Fandral had ended up in enemy hands, heroes confronted Elisra. It turned out that the dragon was an agent of the Fire Lord and had delivered Fandral directly to him. No! No! I didn't betray the Dragonflights! We were all betrayed! 
Ysera was lost in a dream while this whole world came undone! She was rewarded for her efforts after she was slain by the hero. Druids of the Flame resurrected her as a giant burning firehawk. Breathe on in flame! When Thrall was made well again, Malfurion led an assault into the realm of Ragnaros the elemental plane of the Firelands. All of Malfurion and his allies' efforts were waylaid by constant attacks from fire elementals and the treacherous druids of the flame. These druids had perverted their shape-shifting forms. Their Stormcrow form, now a Firehawk. Their cat form, a Blaze. And instead of transforming into a bear, they turned into scorpions. An enraged Fandral wanted his old tutor alive no doubt to put him through unspeakable torment. Slowly, Malfurion and his allies began to win, making ground in the Firelands and even killing Fandral's second-in-command, Leara. Finally, a group of heroes were able to enter the heart of Ragnaros' territory. They destroyed many of the Firelands' most powerful underlings, including the reborn Elisra. What have we here? Visitors to our kingdom in the Firelands. You mortals may remember Alyssa, who spirited me to freedom in Mount Hyjal. She too has been reborn. Born of flame! I wish I could watch her reduce your pitiful band to cinders, but I am needed elsewhere. Farewell! <laughs> I serve a new master now, mortals! After defeating the gatekeeper of Ragnaros' fortress, Baelrock, it was only Fandral that stood between them and the Fire Lord. Well, well, I admire your tenacity. Balorok stood guard over this keep for a thousand mortal lifetimes. But none may enter the Fire Lord's abode! Beg for mercy now, and I may yet allow you to live. Well, With his death, the tortured and insane Fandral's suffering had finally come to an end. The way was clear to the Fire Lord, who would soon follow his major domo in death. So, there you have it, an in-depth look at the lore surrounding the Arc Druid of the Flame, Fandral Staghelm. A tragic tale of loss that sees a grieving father give in to despair malevolent forces taking advantage of his profound loss and twisting him into an instrument of evil. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. I know it's been a long time coming and I hope it was worth the wait to those I know have been waiting for it. If you've enjoyed the art, I've credited as many artists as I could find in the description below. If you want to really help the channel, liking, sharing and subscribing really help the lore goodness coming. Of course, if you wish the channel would just be reduced to ash, you can always dislike it, I guess. To keep up to date with how episodes of Lore of the Cards are coming, you can follow us on Twitter, at the 6 gamers and Facebook, forward slash 6 gamers UK. Until next time, happy Hearthstone.